All right, let the record reflect that we have been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. All right, the people may call their next witness. Zola to the stand. Raise your right hand, please. If you do solemnly swear that the testimony you may be of the cause not being used of this court, shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, I do. Please have a seat in the witness stand and please spell your first and last names for the record. Andrea Mazzola, A N D R E A M A Z Z O L A. All right, Mr. Goldberg. Good morning, Ms. Mazzola. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Ms. Mazzola, directing your attention to the date of June the 13th of 1994, did you participate in some evidence collection with Dennis Fung at the location of 360 North Rockingham and 8? 75 Bundy in Los Angeles? Yes, I did. And on the 14th, did you also participate in some collection at the uh, a Bronco in the print shed? Yes, I did. Now, before getting into those uh, matters, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your training and your experience. First of all, w what is your job title? Criminalist 1. And a criminalist is? Uh, we work in the crime lab, uh, collection, preservation of evidence, and analyzing the evidence, testifying as an expert witness in court. Okay, and is, is part of your job description as a criminalist that you actually have to analyze evidence? Yes, it is. As part of analyzing evidence, do you generate analyzed evidence reports? Yes, we do. And then as part of your job description, are you also required to testify in court as an expert witness? Yes, we are. Was that true when you were first hired with the Los Angeles Police Department as a criminalist one? Yes, it was. Now, before you became a, a criminalist one at the Los Angeles Police Department, did you have some formal training in school? Yes, I did. And what degree do you hold? I hold a Bachelor of Science in Forensic Science. And where is that from? California State University, Sacramento. Before you were uh, allowed to take courses that were specific to forensic science, did you have to take general background science courses? Yes. And uh, what kinds of courses did you take that were general background science courses before you got into the specifics of uh, forensic science? We had to take general chemistry, organic chemistry, qualitative analysis, quant, biochemistry, quantitative analysis, right. chemistry. Biochemistry, we had to take some biology courses such as anatomy, genetics, basic biology. Did you take uh, microbiology? Yes, I did. Organic chemistry? Right. All right. And after you were finished with taking these various uh, general science courses, did you then take some courses that were specific to the area of criminalistics? Yes. Approximately how many courses did you take in school that were specific to the area of criminalistics? It was approximately five. Was one of those courses a trace analysis course? Yes, it was. And what did, what did that involve? It involved the analyzing of trace evidence such as hair, fiber, minute glass particles, um, you know, extremely small pieces of evidence. Did you do any serology in that course? We did a basic ABO blood typing experiment. Okay, and, and uh, what is serology, if you could just give us a, a general definition? Serology deals with the analyzation of bodily fluids. Okay. Now, did this professor that taught you in the uh, trace analysis course use any particular technique to impress on you the importance of maintaining control of your evidence? Yes. Um, if he thought that we were not maintaining control over our evidence, if he thought we were leaving it out on the bench top, he would confiscate the evidence. And since the evidence was your unknown, you had to buy it back with points. And each report was only worth 50 points to begin with. So if you lost 20 points buying your evidence, 
you more or less couldn't pass that one section. Did you lose any points during this uh, course as a result of not maintaining control of your evidence? No, no. All right. And did this technique that the professor used seem to work in impressing on you? It the, worked the... extremely well. Okay. Now, um, as a student, when you were uh, there at the California State University, did you start? Did you participate with other students in starting any organizations in the area of criminalistics? Yes. Um, since forensic science, which is was such a small major, we wanted to try to bring more people into the area, at least let them become familiar with it. So we started an organization, which became recognized by the university, to promote forensic science, to give people an idea of what it was. Okay. Did you also begin attending meetings as a student of the California Association of Criminalists? Yes. And what is that association? It's an organization of criminalists, people in the field. They attend meetings, um, seminars, classes to gain more information in the field, to share ideas, new techniques. Okay. And when you uh, graduated from the California State University, did you begin working at a law enforcement agency? Yes, uh, I as did. Criminals. What agency was that? It was the uh -huh. Kern County District Attorney's Office Crime Lab in Bakersfield. And what was your job title there when you began with the Kern County uh, District Attorney's Office in their crime lab? I was a criminalist. What were you doing in the crime lab? I was assigned to the toxicology unit. And toxicology is what? It's the analysis of blood and urine for drugs of abuse. So you are dealing with biological specimens in, in toxicology? Right. Now, how long were you at the uh, Kern County District Attorney's Office Crime Lab? It's approximately 18 months. And when you were there working in toxicology, um, was there anything that you learned in terms of uh, handling biological specimens and uh, avoiding cross-contamination that would be relevant towards processing a crime scene? Well, any time you're working with biologicals or any evidence, you have to be careful of cross-contamination. You only work on one item or one sample at a time. You never have two items open at the same time. You are very careful about the uh, utensils you use, whether it's pipettes, which are usually disposable, or tweezers or scissors, anything. And when you were there at the uh, Kern County District Attorney's Office Crime Lab, did you have the opportunity to see what other criminalists were doing in areas that were not involved with uh, toxicology? Yes. So did you sort of get an overview of different areas of criminalistics while you were there? Yes, I did. Did you ever have the opportunity of seeing uh, people at the Kern County uh, Crime Lab, the criminalists, processing bloody clothing or uh, clothing from rape cases that might contain biological evidence? Yes, I did. While you were there, did you uh, join any other uh, organizations that are involved in the area of criminalistics? Well, I joined the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. And what is the American Academy of Forensic Sciences as opposed to the California Association of Criminalists? They're similar in that they're both organizations dealing with the area of criminalistics, forensic science, the law. The American Academy takes a wider view. We have people who are in the law. We have dentists. There are different sections dealing with the different professions. Did you also join the uh, California Association of Criminalists? Yes, I joined as a member. Was that in the same time frame? Yes, it was. And you were there for, you said, 18 months? Yes. Now, after you left the Kern County District Attorney's Office Crime Lab, where did you go? I started looking for another job. <laughs> and did you find employment as a, as a criminalist? I found employment as a toxicologist in a private lab. And what was that lab? Uh, Valley Toxicology. So as a toxicologist, were you doing the same thing that you were doing 
uh, when you were working in the Kern County toxicology section? Yes. And you were doing the actual, what, is it a chemical analysis or a physical analysis of, of the biological specimens? It's more of a chemical analysis. Okay. Are, are you test testing for anything other than drugs? No, just drugs. Okay. When were you at the, uh, at this toxicology, Valley Toxicology, what were the, the dates that you were there? Oh, let's see. Let me check my... It's approximately May of 93 to about the middle of December of 93. And after you left Valley Toxicology, where did you go? I was offered a position with LAPD. When did you start with LAPD? January 24th, 1994. And when you were hired, were you hired alone, or were there other people that were hired in the same group? There were three other people who were hired approximately the same time as I was. Now, in approximately April of 1994, did you go through a mini academy? Yes. And what did that involve? It involved showing us the way that the LAPD crime lab collects their evidence um, the different sections, what they had to offer us, what they had available to help us at a crime scene, or analyzing the evidence once we got back to the lab. Did they uh, teach you how to, to physically pick up evidence and collect evidence at a crime scene? Yes. Did, did they teach you uh, how to collect bodily fluids? Yes, they did. And how was that done? Was that a theoretical instruction or a practical? Or a combination? It was a combination. They first told us why they do it this way, why they need to pick up, be it blood or whatever. Then we had practical hands-on where we would actually pick up the blood from different substrates, concrete, carpet, stone. So were these mock crime scenes or, or what were they when you were picking up this blood in the mini academy? It really wasn't like a mock crime scene. They just had the blood on the different substrates that we would tend to run into out in the real world. So we would have hands-on experience on how to manipulate the stain, how to collect it, preserve it, to learn, you know, to be careful about contamination. Did they also teach you uh, other techniques um, such as tool marks, dust prints, shoe prints, and the right. like. Right. Right. Now, how difficult was it for you to learn how to pick up blood, biological evidence? It's not hard at all. Okay. And uh, as a criminalist, when you start as a, a criminalist one, are you expected to go out to crime scenes and pick up evidence? We are expected to accompany the more experienced criminalists when we can. We watch them, the way they process scenes. We are allowed to pick up evidence under their supervision. It, it gives us more training <coughs> under supervision. How long are you a criminalist one before you can become a criminalist two? We're a criminalist one for a year and a half. Now, is there some aspect in which, even though you're a criminalist one, and you've been taught how to do these physical, how to physically collect the evidence, is there some aspect in which you're still being trained in crime scene uh, investigation during that 18 months? In that period, it's more like we were being trained in the discretionary area to go to a crime scene, to look at it, to decide what is evidence, what we can pick up that would be of value, what can be analyzed back at the lab. That, that's the part that we're being trained in as criminalist ones. Well, are you still being trained in the physical part of how you actually physically pick up 
a shoe print or how you physically pick up a, a, a piece of biological evidence? To a certain extent, for the most part, we are trained in the technical area. It's the discretionary area, making the decisions that we are in the process of learning. And what, what all does this discretionary area involve in terms of being a criminalist? Is it just what to pick up and what not to pick up? Well, also it involves dealing with the people you'll find at the scene, the detectives, the coroner's people, um, determining what is viable evidence versus what is really not part of the scene. When you're at a scene, do you simply just pick up anything and everything that um, happens to be in the area or within a certain diameter of the bodies in the case of a murder? How do you go about making that, that kind of a decision? That again is the discretionary area. You have to look at the whole scene, try to get an idea of what could have happened, and start looking for items that could be connected. It's better to pick up a little more than not enough. Is there any problem with just indiscriminately collecting everything that you see? Yes, because you'll spend all your time picking up every single little bit of paper or whatever, and you're not adding towards figuring out what happened. You're adding a lot of garbage is what it is. And is it this area in which during the 18 months you are still being trained in, in terms of how to evaluate a crime scene, mm -hmm. how to make this kind of decision? Yes, that's the area. Now, prior to the uh, work that you did on June the 13th, had you actually gone out on crime scenes and, and uh, seen other people collect evidence and collect some evidence yourself? Yes, I did. Now, when, when you uh, listed the number of crime scenes, do you distinguish between a crime scene and a car search? I did. Some people don't, but at that point I did. Okay, so some people put the two of them together? Right. All right. And with respect to your first crime scene, did you actually pick up any evidence at that crime scene? Yes, under supervision. And was there any biological evidence that was involved in that first crime scene? There was a lot of biological evidence. Can you give us just a, a, a guesstimate as to how many stains? I mean, are we talking about less than a dozen or more oh, than a dozen? More than a dozen. Did you pick up some of those stains yourself? Yes, I did. Now, when you uh, processed that first crime scene, did you get any feedback in terms of how you'd done? We, the people that were processing the scene were given a accommodation for the scene. So this was your first crime scene and you received a commendation for it? Right. And was that presented to you in, in, some, in an award ceremony? They mentioned it at our annual luncheon. They read the commendations. And... Okay. Uh, now, did you also process another crime scene uh, after this and before June the 13th that had biological evidence in it? Yes. And did that have multiple stains as well? Yes, it did. Did you pick up those stains? Yes, I did. Were there any other crime scenes that you participated in before June the 13th that had biological evidence that you physically participated in collecting? There was one that had biological evidence, but the collection procedure was not the procedures used on the other scenes. Okay, now was that a, a car search? or it, Right, this was a car search. Okay, and um, you said that you do make a distinction between those? I do. But you did, but there was one car search that you were involved in that also had biological evidence? Correct. Now, after June the 13th, did you, and, and before today's date, did you participate in any more uh, crime scenes that had biological evidence that needed to be collected? Yes. And can you give us an approximate number? Of scenes? Yeah. Incl and include car searches. Oh, it. okay. For biologicals, there were two actual scenes. 
Okay. Steams. Now, at the uh, crime lab, the Los Angeles Police Department crime lab, do they have a position that's known as criminalist trainee? No. Is that any kind of an official word that's used, a no. trainee? No. But, but as you said, there is, to some extent, you are being trained in, in crime scene processing and investigation. Correct. As a criminalist one. At the uh, crime scenes that the, the crime scenes that you participated in on June the 13th and also on the 14th in the Bronco, uh, if we divide the work of a criminalist up the way that you've suggested into the mental and discretionary type components and the physical collection components. Overworld. Which, uh, who was responsible for the, the mental or the discretionary type components? That is the criminalist three area. Okay. Now, going back to a second to this mini academy, when you were going through the mini academy, do they actually teach you specifically what the people in serology are going to do with the evidence? after you've collected it in the case of biological evidence? Not specifically, no. Okay. And do they train you actually how to do DNA tests? No. So are they training you the physical collection procedures? That's correct. Now, I'd like to uh, direct your attention back to the date of June the 13th of 1994. Uh, at some point in the early morning, did you receive a telephone call that awakened you? I was already awake, <laughs> Okay. but I did get the call. And what time was that? It was approximately 525 in the morning. All right. And uh, did that call notify you that you were to respond to a um, crime scene? Yes. Now, are all criminalists at the laboratory expected to respond to crime scenes? We are all put on a rotation. And how often are you on this rotation, approximately? I'm approximately three months. Every three months we come up. And for what length of a period of time are you on call every three months? Sometimes we are on call for a week. We take the evening calls at night. Sometimes we are assigned to the weekend, and that's 24 hours a day. So on this particular occasion on June 13th, did this simply happen to be the occasion that you were on call? Yes, it was. What did you have to do after you got this call notifying you that you needed to respond to a crime scene? I called my criminalist three, Mr. Fung, and informed him that we had a scene and we were to meet at the laboratory. And was he also on call? Yes. For what purpose did you need to meet at the laboratory? We needed to meet there to pick up the crime scene truck. And did you do so? Yes. And did, the, uh, did you then drive in the truck to the location, to the Rockingham location? Yes. Now, while you were uh, going to the Rockingham location in the truck, was there any conversation with respect to filling out the uh, crime scene identification checklist, the, the officer in charge? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to take a look at People's 161 for identification. One, please. Ms. Hmm. Mazzola, is, is the resolution on your screen good enough so that you um, can? Not really. <laughs> Maybe we can just focus in on the area that says OIC name. Okay. Now you need to, to, to uh, pull the paper a little bit over to the right. All right. Now, now can you recognize this? Right. All right. And 
Did you, uh, is this your handwriting? Yes, it is. And your name is where it says officer in charge? Correct. And what was the conversation that you had with respect to filling out that portion of this form? Objection is to the hearsay remarks of anyone else Sustain. in the truck. As to what? I, I, I Sustain. Hearsay as to what was what the discussion was. Okay. Well, it's not coming in for the truth of the matter, Your Honor. Well, well, excuse me, sustained, still sustained. Okay. But at any rate, you put your, your, your name was put in that location. Correct. And without telling us what the conversation was, there was some conversation about it. Right. Okay. Now, after you actually got to the location, uh, did you continue to be the, uh, or were you the officer in charge after you got to the Rockingham location? Once we found out what was all involved, I was not the officer in charge. All right, and who became the officer in charge? Mr. Fung. Now, what are the functions of the officer in charge as opposed to the person assisting him or her? The officer in charge, number one, talks to the detectives to try to get an idea of what is going on. They make the discretionary calls as to what to pick up as evidence. Um, they interact with the people at the scene, whether it's the detectives, police officers, coroner's officials. Who directs the, the other SID people, like print people and photography people? That's the officer in charge. Now, did you perform those functions at the Rockingham or Bundy locations? No. I'd next like to take a look at um, People's 189. For identification. Now, with respect to uh, People's 189 for identification, uh, when was this document filled out? Part of that document. Foundation. We don't even know who filled it out first. Sustain. Rephrase the question. Okay. Is this your handwriting? Yes, it is. Okay. And when was this filled out? Part of it was filled out the morning of the 13th. Was that after you, shortly after you arrived at Rockingham? Yes. Sustain. When was that? shortly after we arrived at the Rockingham location. Okay. And uh, you placed, uh, and did you have any conversation with respect to how this form was going to be filled out that you can remember? No, not really. Okay. W was this a matter of consequence in your mind? No. All right. For the record, People's uh, 189 is the uh, vehicle search checklist. Now, uh, thank you. That's, that's fine. Uh, by the way, did you do any searching of the interior of the Bronco at any time on the 13th, or was that done at some later time? That was done at a later time. Right. Now, shortly after you arrived at the Rockingham location, did uh, you have any conversations with any detectives uh, who gave you a walkthrough of the location? I personally did not talk to any of the detectives. Were you present when that happened? Yes. And without telling us what was said, what happened? They showed us some things that they were interested in, they wanted us to take a look at. Was that just a, a general walkthrough? At first it was the Bronco, and after there were some other items they wanted us to take a look at. Do you recall who the detective was that did that, the detectives? I personally don't. Okay. Now, did you uh, physically collect some of the stains that were located at the Rockingham location that morning, the morning of the 13th? Yes. And did Mr. Fung participate physically in the collection of, the, of some of those stains? Yes, he did. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to take a look at the uh, 
demonstration board. It's People's 162 yes. for identification. I don't know whether you can see this, uh, Ms. Mazzola. Um, I have an idea what's on it. Okay. Using this uh, demonstration board, can you describe for us, starting with the, the first cell on People's 162, this, Excuse me a second. the steps that are involved in uh, collecting a stain? How many, my... Yeah. Maybe we can see that, that cell. Can we see that cell? All right, Ms. Mazzola, can you see it on your monitor here? Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, um, that shows two spots, blood spots, that are numbered. All right, and is the first phase in this collection stated on the board, the numbering and measuring? Phase? Yes, it is. And does, is there a documentation uh, aspect to that phase as well? They, the location, measurements, the photo ID numbers and a brief description are noted on the evidence collection sheet. Right. And uh, are, are the items also photographed before yes, they're they are. collected? So all of that occurs prior to the physical collection? Yes. Okay. Now directing your attention to uh, cell number two that says damp and swatch. What's involved in this stage of the collection procedure? A small cloth swatch of the approximate size you need is selected with a pair of clean tweezers. A drop of distilled water is put on the swatch. It's then shaken, so any excess water is shaken off. And uh, directing your attention now to cell number three that says collect substrate control. What, what is done in this uh, phase of the collection procedure? The cloth swatch is placed on the substrate the concrete or whatever, as close to the stain as possible, but without getting it in the stain, is to get a background control of what the sample is on. What does the term substrate mean? That is just the substance that the item of interest is on. So if the item of interest, for example, instead of being on a walkway, we're on a wall, what would be the substrate? The wall would be the substrate. Or if it were on clothing, what would be the substrate? The clothing. What is the purpose of taking this control that's, that's near the stain but not on the stain? Well, this could be used for two factors. One is to provide a background, what the sample was on, so when they go to run the tests on the sample, they can see if the background itself would interfere with the tests. The control can also be checked for DNA or other items of interest to see if any contamination took place. Now, this, so this control is basically just a blank swatch that has water on it that's put on the concrete in this example? Correct. So do you handle this piece of evidence exactly, or this piece of uh, swatch exactly the same way? that you would handle a swatch that was actually put on the stain? It's handled the same way. Why is it that you use the identical handling procedures for the substrate control that you would use for a swatch that was actually put on the stain? Because you want them to be as identical as possible, the only difference being one will contain the item of interest, the other won't. Okay. Now, directing your attention to uh, cell number four on People's 180, excuse me, 162 for identification, what phase of the collection procedure is shown here? It looks like the cloth swatch is being placed into a small plastic envelope, small plastic bag. The control is placed in one 
bag. Okay. And now direct your attention to uh, cell number five that says clean tweeze. Excuse me. That was Mr. Farrell speaking. Oh, I'm sorry. Now direct your attention to cell number five that says uh, clean tweezers on our demonstration. Yes. Um, after the control is taken, the tweezers are cleaned with distilled water and a chem wipe, which is like a laboratory Kleenex. Okay. And now directing your attention to cell number six, which states in our board, take new swatch, then dampen it. What does this uh, phase of the collection procedure involve? Okay, our swatches are stored in plastic tubes, so you have to take a small selection of them out of the tube without handling them. Then you can select the correct size that you need. So that is what's being shown. How do you decide which size to, uh, to take? It depends on the size of the stain. You want to select a size swatch that is small enough that so when you apply it to the stain, you would get it as concentrated as possible. Now, in this particular photograph, it's kind of hard for me to see that there are actually swatches in that little right. bottle. But is that, is that what you're saying, that right. the swatches come from that bat bottle? That's right. OK. Now, let's take a look at uh, cell number seven. It says, collect stain. And number card removed is in parentheses. What are you doing here? That would be the actual collection of the stain. And did you uh, have to uh, dampen the, the swatch right. before it's you? Right, the same as with the control. You okay. dampen the swatch, shake off the excess water, then you apply the swatch to the stain. And finally, taking a look at cell number eight that says package stain in same envelope with substrate control. What's involved in, in this procedure? The swatch with the stain is placed in a separate plastic envelope. Both the control and the swatch with the item you're interested in are placed in the same coin envelope with the item number written on the outside. All right. Now, when you're, uh, thank you. Now, when you're collecting one of these stains, uh, do you collect one stain at a time? Yes. And I want to ask you some questions about different things that could happen when you're collecting a stain. Do you, do you ever drop the tweezers while you're doing that? That can happen. What happens if you do that? You clean them all over again. When you're taking a swatch that actually has blood on it, do you ever drop that bloody swatch? That's never happened to me. Okay. When you're pouring the, um, maybe pouring's not the right word, but when you're taking some of those little swatches out of the uh, container, the little pill bottle, mm -hmm. do those swatches ever fall? They do occasionally, yes. What do you do with those swatches? I don't use them. Could you use them as substrate controls? You could. But you do not do that? But I personally don't do that. So you just throw them away? Right. When you're picking up a swatch, do any of the swatches ever stick together? That happens sometimes. Okay. What do you do in that kind of instance? If you're taking uh, the, either the control or the actual item, you can use both swatches. Okay, but what if you're, you're, you have two swatches stuck together? Do you, do you try to separate them, or is it possible that you could apply both of them to the stain at the same time without knowing it? You can tell if two of them are stuck together. Um, you separate them, and you, you use one swatch at a time, either to pick up the control or to pick up the stain itself. Okay. 
And what about the labeling of the uh, coin envelopes? Have you ever mislabeled one of those by writing the wrong item number? No. Okay. When are they? Uh, when are the envelopes labeled in relationship to when the collection takes place? Before. The envelope. The envelopes are labeled before. Okay. So do you put the? If you're collecting stay number five, for example, mm -hmm. in our demonstration, you're going to put that in an envelope that's labeled what? Number five. And that would be done before you moved on to number six? Right. Now, when you were uh, at the Rockingham location, did you <coughs> place your initials on all the coin envelopes as you were collecting them? At the time I thought I did, looking back, I apparently didn't. And do you recall uh, testifying at what we've been referring to or sometimes referred to as a Griffin hearing on August 23rd, I believe, of 1994? I remember testifying at the Griffin hearing. Okay. And in that, when you were testifying at that hearing at that time, did you believe that you had put all of your initials or your initials on all of the items that you collected on the 13th? At that time, I believe I had. And did you since learn that you did not? Right. Just saying, Chris, question. Okay. Did you since look at photographs of some of the items collected? Yes. And have you learned that you did not? I learned I had not. On the other scenes that you had processed, has moved to strike the last answer. It's, it's conclusory as oh. opposed to testifying. Oh. Okay. Now, on the other stains, excuse me, other scenes that you had collected stains on prior to the 13th, uh, had you initialed on those occasions? Yes. And why wasn't that done here at the scene? I was told that there were only two of us that would be sustained. Okay, without telling us what was said, was there a conversation about this? Yes. And after the conversation, did, uh, was there some conclusion that was arrived at? Yes. And what was the conclusion? Objection. What's the basis? I'm here to say again. Oh, well. There were only going to be two of us at the scenes collecting evidence. We were working as a team, so really didn't matter if our initials were on the envelope since we were working as a team. Now, as to the uh, crime scene identification checklist that we uh, talked a little bit about, when you testified at the Griffin hearing, what was your understanding of how that checklist was supposed to be used? At the time, I thought that everything had to be filled out. The other scenes that I had gone on, they had filled out the checklist. Okay. Maybe we can see a portion. I think it's 1107. but it's 1107 for identification. All right, Mr. Farrell, what page number is that? They're numbered at the top. This is at page 202. I don't think it has a number. It's the one that has 17, 18, and 19. All right. Or 18, 17, and 19. Is this the form that you use out in the field when you're collect, collecting evidence? Yes. It's a little blurry there. Okay, now, prior to testifying at the, the uh, Griffin hearing, did you believe that every single box and every single column needed to be filled out? Yes. 
and as a result of your training and experience after the Griffin hearing, did you learn something different? I learned that this is a general guideline for us. Some of the boxes really don't apply to us at the scene. When did you start, when did you learn that? So right after I testified at the Griffin hearing. And got back to the laboratory. Right. Okay. Uh, with respect to the time column, have you noticed now, based upon the experience that you have to date, that different criminalists in the Los Angeles Police Department have different practices with respect to how they fill out that column? Yes. And how is that used? Some fill out every single individual time that something is collected. Others put a starting time that they start collecting evidence and an ending time when they stop. Everything that is collected is collected while you're at the scene. So it happens between those two times. And then are there some people that, that use what I guess you might call an intermediate type uh, usage of that time column and put in some times as you did on the 13th? Right. Sustain. Are there, some people, the question. are there some people that use an intermediate technique? Yes. All right. Now, getting back to the uh, collection of the evidence at Rockingham, perhaps we can take a look at People's 120 for identification. It's the, uh, the board of Rockingham, the outside. Now, with respect to uh, People's 120 for identification, do you recognize uh, what, what's depicted here? I don't. It's can you not see showing this? on. Uh, it's not going to be on the monitor. Oh. Maybe you can just step down okay. for, for a moment and take a look at this. Are these photographs that depict various items that you participated in collecting on the 13th at Rockingham? Yeah. Overruled. Overruled. Okay. Now, uh, when you were doing the physical collection on these, do you recall what order they were done in? Were they done in numerical order? For the most part, yes. And would that mean that you started with the stains that are down towards the, the gate? The first stain I was collected was on, me, on the door of the door. Do you know who physically collected that? I know that physically collected Now, did you then begin with... I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. I was the one who collected the one on the Bronco. Now, with respect to the stains that are uh, leading from the Bronco, uh, into the driveway area. Did you and Dennis Fung uh, physically collect those? Objection as to her and Dennis Fung. Oh, well. Yes. Okay. Now, can you tell us when you first started the collection, can you be more specific as to who was doing what in terms of the physical collection? As I said, I was the one that collected the stain off the Bronco, and Mr. Fung collected the stain on the street. When we got to the driveway, he did, I believe it was like the first two stains, and I took over from there and was the one physically collecting the rest. With respect to the other stains, do you have an, a, a recollection of whether he physically participated in collecting any of those? He was present 
for some. So at the beginning of the, of the stains, uh, he was doing more of the physical collection and then towards the, the end, less. And with respect to the first phase of the collection procedure, the documentation, the numbering, and the uh, measuring phase, how did the two of you work together to accomplish that? We worked as a team. Right. Now, with respect to uh, the stains at the end of the outdoor area, stain number seven and stain number eight, do you recall where Dennis Fung was around the time that those were collected? not present, but as I kept working, he came Do you recall uh, whether anyone else was present at the time those stains were collected in yes. the immediate area? There was someone in the immediate area. Who was that? Mr. Steve Johnson. Who's he? He is the assistant lab director. Do you know uh, where Dennis Fung was at the time that he was not present? No, I don't. Or where he went? But he went somewhere and then at some point came back. Correct. Now, with respect to the uh, stains at the Rockingham location, were ever, was every single last stain collected or were there some that were not collected? There were some that were not collected. And what is your training with respect to the uh, need to collect every stain as opposed to less than all the stains? Well, on a trail, you want to get a representative sample. You want to get the first few stains. You want to pick up the last few stains. The ones in between, as long as they appear to be going in the general direction, there is nothing out of the ordinary with them. Not every single stain has to be collected. And is that the technique that you and Mr. Fung use with respect to collecting these stains? All right. You can, uh, may, I want to ask you some questions that you may have to refer to your crime scene identification checklist for, so you can resume the stand. All right, Mr. Goldberg, are you going to refer back to this exhibit, People's 120, again? Um, I, was, I, I was going to talk about stains, so I thought it might be useful for it to be here, unless logistically we just can't do that. Oh, if you're going to be referring to it, proceed. Okay, with respect to the uh, stains numbered four through six on our diagram, with the photo ID numbers four through six, uh, down towards the, the beginning portion of the uh, driveway, can you tell us the time frame that those stains were collected? I'm sorry, Your Honor, the record should reflect that the witnesses refreshing your recollection said notes may I approach the witnesses? You may. Thank you. All right, Ms. Mazzola, what are you referring to? I'm referring to the crime scene notes. All right, thank you. Proceed. They were collected around 9 o'clock, all within a few minutes of each other. And with respect to the stains that are up towards the, uh, close to the entrance area, stain number 7, stain number 8, what was the time frame of those stains? Those were approximately 10 to 15 minutes later. Did you have some time frames in your crime scene identification checklist um, that you can give us? Item 7 was a, collected approximately 9, 10. Item 8, approximately 15 minutes later. Okay. Now, when you were at the uh, location, from what you saw of all of the stains, did any of them appear to have been stepped in? No. Now, before, I, I, I can take this down now, Your Honor. All right. Carol, I want you to swing that around. 
before you left the Rockingham location, did you and Mr. Fung do any, go through any process in terms of double checking the evidence that you had? Yes. What was that? We knew what item numbers we collected. We looked at each individual item to make sure that we had everything. Okay. And is that a routine thing that you have done on the other crime scenes that you were on before this? At the other crime scenes, we make sure that we have everything that we collected. What did you do with the various coin envelopes that you had with the biological evidence of them in them? They were put in a small paper bag. Do you recall whether they were lying down or standing up? And they were standing up. And what was done with the paper bag? The paper bag was put into the back of the crime scene truck. Was the crime scene truck locked? All the time. Approximately what time was it that you left the Rockingham location? That was approximately 10 o'clock, somewhere around there. Were you wearing gloves during the collection procedure of the biological evidence at Rockingham? Yes. And do you know whether you were wearing the same pair of gloves the whole time? I probably changed gloves. I don't remember how many times, but. Objection, Your Honor. It's speculative. You said I probably must have struck the answer. Sustain. Rephrase the question. Do you have a practice? Excuse me. Excuse me just curious to disregard the last question and answer. Okay. Do you have a practice at a crime scene to uh, wear the same pair of gloves throughout the entire crime scene? No. What is your practice? I change the gloves when they start getting uncomfortable. If I am done processing an area and I am moving on to a completely separate area, I will change gloves. By the way, uh, just going back for a second to, to the blood collection procedure, can you, do you ever touch the blood with your uh, gloved hands? No. When you're collecting it? No. What about the swatches? No. Is that something that has happened to you uh, by accident, where you have touched a uh, bloody swatch with your gloved hand? No. Now, what do you do with the gloves that you're wearing at the time that you leave the Rockingham location, do you keep them on? No, we take a paper bag, which we label trash, and any trash that we generate, whether it's used gloves, swabs, uh, chem wipes, anything, goes into this bag, and we take it with us. Okay. Now, after you left the Rockingham location, where did you go? We went to Bundy. Approximately what time did you arrive at the Bundy location? 10, 15, somewhere around there. Now, when you arrived at the Bundy location from your own independent recollection, what was going on at that location when you arrived? There were a lot of people there. The coroners were there. Um, it appeared that there were detectives at the scene. From your independent recollection, do you recall uh, whether you saw the body of either Nicole Brown or uh, Ronald Goldman? I remember seeing a brief glimpse of Mr. Goldman. Where do you recall him being? He was up on the walkway. Were you playing, paying close attention to what was going on? during this period of time? I was trying to look at everything. There was a lot going on at that time. OK. Uh, do you recall an inst incident where uh, Mr. Fung took a bag over to Mr. Lang, Detective Lang? I remember Mr. Fung taking a bag up to the area. Okay. Did you know what was going on at that time? No. Did you see what he did with it? Uh, no, I don't. <clears throat> did you ever, from your own independent recollection, recall seeing Nicole Brown uh, at the location with any blanket over her? I don't recall seeing Nicole Brown. Do you remember anything about a blanket? 
I remember seeing a, a white blanket there. And where do you remember seeing it the first time that you can recall seeing it? It was up on the walkway near the steps. And did you see how it got there? No. Now, I'd like to uh, direct your attention to people's 165 for identification, the board showing the Bundy biological evidence. for a moment just to take a look at this. Okay, does this diagram appear to depict the Bundy location? Yes, it does. And do the photographs appear to depict uh, various items of biological evidence that you and Mr. Fung collected on the 13th? Yes. Now, with respect to uh, this diagram, I don't, it's not, I don't think it's on here, but do you recall the, the first item of evidence that, biological evidence rather, that you collected, the first stain? I believe it was on a tree stump. I don't see it on the Okay, list. it's the photographs isn't there. Right. And for what purpose was that collected? That was collected as a reference sample for Mr. Goldman. With respect to the, the biological evidence in the uh, caged off area, can you describe for us, with, in, in the physical collection procedure, how you and Mr. Fung worked together in collecting that evidence? He was supervising. He was watching me after we had marked the numbers that had been photographed, measured, sketched. He watched as I collected the biological. Okay. And, uh, do you recall whether he did any of the physical collection with respect to those items in the caged off area? There, I believe there were a couple of items that he personally collected. From your independent recollection today, do you know which ones those are? No, I don't. All right. And did you uh, then begin, did, which, which did you do first, the caged off area or what we referred to as the trail in terms of collecting biological evidence? The caged off area. Right. And at some later point you began working on the trail? That's correct. Do you recall uh, who did most of the physical swatching on the items on the trail? I did the swatching. Okay, now the I... Do you recall any stains now from your independent recollection that Mr. Fung physically participated in swatching on the trail? Item 112, he picked up a little more blood off of that item than I had picked up. And there was one other item farther down the trail that he picked up. I can't which now, when you said item number 112, were you looking at the photograph oh, that, has, right. that has item number 47? That's it, correct. Okay, and does the call out line depict the general area where that was located? Yes. Now, can you specifically tell us in terms of item or photo number where this other uh, item was, or is it just a general recollection? It was just a general recollection. Can you uh, tell us anything that stands out in your mind about that other stain or the circumstances surrounding collecting that stain? Well, I remember that Mr. Fung knelt down and became a little upset because there were several 
purple berries in the area, and she had knelt down on one and had stained his pants. So he was a little upset about that. Is that how you remember that's, that item? That's how I remember that he had picked up one farther down the trail. Okay. Excuse me, Council. Ms. Mazzola, if you would, you've, uh, over the last several questions and the answers, you've talked over each other. Ms. Mazzola, let Mr. Goldberg finish. Uh, asking the question. Mr. Goldberg, let her finish answering the question before we start with the next one. Sorry, Your Honor. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Now, when you were collecting these items along the trail area, directing your attention to stain number 50, that's uh, item number 115, and then stain number 51, it's, it's down here in the lower right-hand corner. That's uh, item number 116. Do you recall specifically why they, why they were numbered in that order? I do not recall why they were numbered in that order. Okay. Do you, uh, when you were at a scene, did you make, when you were at this scene, did you make it a practice to, to number them in some sort of uh, sequence uh, based on the geography of the location? Or? Yes. Now, with respect to stain number 52, that's item number 117, do you recall uh, collecting that stain? Yes, I do. Is there anything about that stain or the substrate control on that stain that stands out in your memory? It stands out in my memory because when I went to take the control, a red color of pigment came up on the swatch, and that's the first time that's happened to me. So. And it's about the same color as the driveway, so that's why it stands in order. Other than that, do you recall anything particularly coming up on the control swatches on the other items in the trail? Other than maybe a little dirt thing, spectacular. But, but nothing that stood out in your mind? Do you, do you recall one way or the other? I mean, was it something you took a note of? So the only one that stood out in your mind in terms of coming up with something on the control was number 52? Correct. Okay, thank you. You can resume your seat. Mr. Goldberg, I'd like to take our uh, recess at this point. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our first recess for the morning. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Do not discuss the case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Don't discuss the matter with anybody else. Do not conduct any deliberations till the matter has been submitted to you. We'll stand in recess until 1030. Ms. Mazzola, you may step down. You're ordered to return at 1030. All right, thank you.
let the record reflect that we've now been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Ms. Andrea Mazzola is on the witness stand undergoing direct examination by Mr. Goldberg. Good morning again, Ms. Mazzola. Good morning. Uh, Ms. Mazzola, you reminded that you were still under oath. Mr. Goldberg, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. We were talking about the substrate controls, I believe, before we left. Is it necessary, do you always uh, have to collect a substrate control in every situation when you collect a stain using the LAPD procedures? If it is possible to collect one, we collect one. Okay, well, when would it not be possible? Can you give us an example? If, say, the blood covers the entire area, if it's um, a small piece of stone or wood or whatever, then there would be no surface area to collect a control off of. You mean if there was no uncontaminated Correct. area? Correct. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions uh, more about the Griffin hearing before we continue with the Bundy collection. Uh, this hearing in August of uh, 1994. When did you first become aware that you were going to testify in that hearing? Uh, it was that morning. And how was it that you became aware of it? I was already at work in the toxicology section and I got a phone call from Michelle Kessler, the lab director. Had you ever testified before that as an expert witness in court? In toxicology cases, yes. Can you give us an approximation of, of how many times? Five to seven. Okay. And when she told you that you were going to uh, be needed in court, how much time went by between then and when you actually showed up in court? Probably not more than 10 minutes or so. Did she tell you what case it was going to be on? Yeah, she said the case, so. Okay. So you figured it was this? All right. All right. And uh, you didn't have any advance warning before she called uh, that you no. were going to be testifying? When you got to court, what happened? I was led up. Well, I should say led down to the ninth floor, and Mr. Matheson was coming out. Hold on for a second. And who's Mr. Matheson? Uh, he was the serology supervisor at the time. Okay, so he was coming out of where? Out of the courtroom. And what happened? And he asked me if I had my notes, a binder, and I said, what notes? So he gave me his binder of notes and I was brought in. Did you have any opportunity to review Mr. Matheson's notes before you went into the courtroom? No. Did you know how his binder was organized? No. When you were brought in, were you brought in for the purposes of testifying? Yes. And did you, uh, were you called by the defense or prosecution? I was called by the defense. Did you have an opportunity to discuss with the defense beforehand what questions they were going to be asking you? No or uh, discuss any aspect of the case with the prosecution in advance? No. So you were a, a criminalist one, and uh, you're testifying on the Simpson case. You didn't have a chance to speak with the uh, questioner in advance or review your notes. How did you feel? How did you feel at that moment in time? Were you nervous? Nervous and thoroughly alone. <laughs> Okay. And had you had a, a occasion even to think about the case mentally and trying to, to go through and remember what had happened prior to getting up on the, the witness stand? No. Oh, well. Let's see. Were you regularly thinking about the case uh, prior to then? No, I wasn't. All right. Now, uh, at the um, Griffin hearing, were you asked some questions regarding uh, who collected what at the Bundy location? Yes. I'd like to uh, ask you some questions on page 735 of the transcript. Uh, lines 12 through lines 26. Excuse 
excuse me, yes, with the corporate. Do I need to bring the transcript? All right, thank you, Council. Proceed. Uh, actually, I'll start on 734, line 27 through 735, line 26. Are you ready, Council? Do you have that? Uh, uh, 27. Question, and which, I'm sorry, at Bundy again, were there certain blood stains that you collected and other blood stains that were collected by Mr. Fung? Answer, yes. Question, and which blood stains were collected by Mr. Fung? Answer, I believe he collected the red stains that were near the shoe prints that were made on the walkway. Question, would you please look at your notes and tell me which numbers those are? Question. And when you say that, you say he collected the actual foot shoe prints or he collected alleged drops that were near the shoe prints. Answer. He, if I remember correctly, took swatches of the red stains that were constituting the footprint itself. Question. Can you tell us which ones those were, please? Answer. Property items 55 and 56. Question. And that is it? Answer. Yes. Question, all other blood stains at the Bundy crime scene were collected by you, ma'am? Answer, yes. Do you recall that testimony? Somewhat. Okay. And uh, since testifying at this hearing, was there an occasion when you and uh, Dennis Fung went over the crime scene identification checklist again to try to... Uh, make notations as to who physically collected which items. Ruby, oh, excuse me, overall. Yes. All right. And have you since had an occasion to think about yourself, what happened at the scene and who did what? Yes. And uh, did you in fact do, other than on stain 55 and 56, the shoe prints, most of the physical swatching on the other stains? Most of the physical swatching, yes. All right. <clears throat> and since then, have you come up with the rec two recollections that you've testified to on stain 47 and the item with the berry? Yes. Now, at the time that you testified at this uh, Griffin hearing, did you believe that all of the photographs taken of the blood stains had uh, rulers in them? 
or scales in them? I believe that they had, yes. What made you think that? So I had seen the photographer lay down a scale on one of the drops, so I assumed that he was going to do it for all of them. Did um, you since look at the crime? Have you since had an opportunity to review the crime scene photographs? Yes. Had you had an opportunity to review the crime scene photographs before testifying at the Griffin hearing? No. And in reviewing the crime scene photographs, did you see a scale on every single one of the photographs? No, I did not. All right. I'd like to um, direct your attention to uh, an exhibit that we've previously marked as defense. 1081. This is the crime scene identification checklist, Your Honor. All right. Bundy. Ms. Pozzola, do you recognize this to be part of the crime scene identification checklist for Bundy? Yes. And whose handwriting is on that list? Mine. Now, do you see the notation that says, was the scene, excuse me, has the scene been altered? If so, by whom and how? Yes. Did you write that question mark in there or did someone else do it? I did. And why did you do that? Because at the time, I did not know if the scene had been altered. There's this an assumption that it had because the coroners were there. <clears throat> All right. Now, uh, is it your understanding as a criminalist that you have a responsibility or that the criminalist has a responsibility to make inquiries of anyone in terms of whether the scene was altered? The criminalist really does not do any investigative work. Okay, but does the criminalist talk to the investigating officer? Yes. So would the uh, criminalist perhaps ask about questions about what happened prior to their arrival on the scene? Yes. But when you say investigative work, what are you talking about when you use that term? Actually talk to the individual people to find out if they personally had moved anything, where they had been. You mean in terms of a more formal witness right. interview? Does, do the criminalists do that at Los Angeles Police Department? No. Thank you. Now I'd like to uh, talk about some of the items that were collected in and around the, the caged off area at the Bundy location. And uh, first the, the glove, I think it's People's 164. Your Honor, maybe I could just put a piece of butcher paper down on the uh, little table over there so she, we can take this out. This is all I'd like to, um, after putting the, the gloves on, remove people 77 and describe what you're doing for the record. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have a knife or Do you have a preference? <laughs> no.
I am opening the sealed envelope. I am removing the paper bag. And I'm opening the bag. And removing the glove. Now, do you recognize any of the writing on that paper bag? Yes. Whose writing is that? It looks like most of it is my writing. Okay. And is that the paper bag into which uh, the glove was placed at the Bundy location? Yes. Now, have you had an opportunity to look at some videotapes uh, showing yourself collecting a glove and also a cap at the Bundy location? Yes. Prior to seeing those videotapes, did you have an independent recollection of who collected those items? I knew that I collected most of the items in that area. Did you recall specifically who collected the glove uh, prior to viewing the videotape? Specifically, no. All right. Did the viewing of the videotape refresh your recollection? Yes. Now, prior to uh, this crime scene, well, let me back up for a second. When did you actually start taking the uh, criminalistics courses at school, the criminalistics portions of your uh, formal education? Oh, let's see. 1987, 1988, somewhere in there. So had you been involved in the forensic science community then for approximately six years or so prior to collecting this glove? Sustain, rephrase the question. How long had you been involved in the forensic science community prior to collecting this glove? I had contact with them since beginning my forensic courses at school. And that was how many years? Six, seven, somewhere in there. I reject the move to strike it. It's totally irrelevant, but we should have contact. Oh. All right. And can you show us uh, now the technique that is used to collect a piece of uh, evidence such as this glove by placing it back in the bag? I know it's sort of wrinkled, but maybe you can just okay, do af it for us. After the photo ID number is written on the bag, corresponding to the number given the glove, the bag is opened, and you want to pick up the glove in a secure grip and but touching as small an area as possible. And you just put it in and fold the bag closed securely. And that's it. That's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. And did you feel qualified to do that after being involved in the forensic science community for about six years? Yes. Now I'd like to show you uh, people's next exhibit. Uh, I think it's, let's see, 78. It's the uh, cap. Yeah. All right, do we want to place that back in the envelope?
Can you now retrieve people 78 for identification and show us what you're doing? Okay, Just removing the paper bag from the envelope. Opening the bag. And retrieving the hat. And what is that item? That is a knit watch cap. And who recovered that from the location? I did. Do you recognize the writing that's on the uh, packaging? Yes. Whose is that? And that's my writing. Okay. You can replace that and describe what you're doing for the record. Thank you. Ms. Mazzilla, does there appear to be any trace evidence or anything that was left on that uh, butcher paper? I don't see anything. Right, well, perhaps we can just dispose of it then. Okay. Uh, I'd now like to show you a videotape that we've previously marked as Defense 1083 for identification. And then I'll ask you some questions about it. Oh, can we have the lights dimmed a little bit? On, I think we can get One better day. resolution that way. Now, uh, thank you. Ms. Mazzola, did uh, Defense 1083 depict you at the crime scene collecting some evidence? Yes, it does. What were you collecting in that? I tape? was collecting the hat and glove at Bundy. Okay, and uh, did you change gloves in between collecting the hat and the glove? No. Why not? The hat and the glove at Bundy were touching each other, they were not in two completely separate areas. They were in physical contact with each other. Okay. And when you were at a crime scene and collecting evidence, uh, is it your habit to, uh, if you see something on your gloves or see some, some blood or trace on your gloves, to change them? Yes. So the glove and the hat were in close proximity? Yes. Now, I'd like to show you another exhibit that's been marked as People's 192 for identification, and then I'd like to ask you some questions about that.
Okay, with, if we can stop for just a second. Uh, I would like to direct your attention to the dark area that is in approximately the middle of the screen. And for the record, this is just shortly after Mr. Fung put down an item and then disappeared up the steps. He's no longer depicted in the spring. Yes. Okay, let's continue. And we can stop for just a second. Uh, we've stopped on a, a card that I think says 103, and it appears to depict part of the glove on the, the left side of the screen and part of the knit cap on the right side of the screen. Is that correct? That's correct. Is, is this what you were referring to when you were saying that they were in close proximity? Yes. And why is that significant? Well, any trace that I think would be moved from one to the other if you hadn't changed gloves and they were not in such close proximity, that would be more of a concern than if they're side by side like that. Okay, and is this where, where they were at the time that you first saw them? Yes. And when you collected them? Yes. Okay, let's continue. Let's stop for a second. Now we have a photograph that has three evidence cards in it. Uh, did you place those evidence cards down or did someone else do it? Someone else. And who is that? I'm Mr. Fung. And uh, does this photograph depict the envelope and the glove and the watch cap, excuse me, the cap after the three evidence cards were placed down? Yes. Let's continue. Now, if we can stop for just a second. Again, you see that dark area that I directed your attention to on the first frame that we stopped on? Yes. And, and now, for the record, we're on a frame at the end of this collage that has a, a crime scene tape across the uh, upper portion of the screen, Your Honor. Yes, it appears to be the uh, step area. It appears to be Mr. Fung wearing booties on the second and third steps. Thank you. Now, with respect to the area, the dark area that I directed your attention to, do you know what that was? No. Was it the glove? No. Did you ever see the glove in any location while you were at the scene, other than as depicted in the still photography? No. Now I'd like to uh, direct your attention to an item that we've marked as People's 32 for identification. And also uh, 191 for identification. May I approach the witness? You may. I'm showing you people's 32 for identification. Do you recognize what's to, what, what is uh, in this envelope, or this plastic baggie, rather? Yes. What is that? That appears to be the envelope that was found at Bundy. Do you recognize any of the writing on the packaging? Yes. Whose is that? Some of it is mine. Who wrote item number 39 on there? Is that your writing? That appears to be my writing. And what about 104? That's mine. Is, is 104 the photo? Yes. And uh, directing your attention to people's 191 for identification, is this uh, the same type of bag that was used in the scientific investigation division? Yes. All right. Now, 
Did you package at the scene the eyeglass envelope, the bloody envelope, into the packaging material, the uh, paper bag that has the photo ID and item number ID on it? Yes. How did you do that? I picked up the envelope wearing gloves in a small, relatively clean area and placed it in the bag, folded down the top. Okay. And is the bag that it's placed in appear to be the same type as the one that I've uh, just given you, the fresh one? Just, yeah, brown paper bag. All right. Now, perhaps we can see the, the clip of tape that's previously been marked as uh, Defense 1082. I want you to, to look to, have we already, maybe we can back it up again, very closely at the item that's being passed between yourself and Mr. Fung. Maybe we can just see that again. Do you see that? Yes. All right, we're stopping at frame 13, 34, 24. It's a little blurry. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Is that the entire tape? <laughs> okay. Did you get a chance to, to, to take another look at that? Yes, I caught a glimpse of it. What? I caught a glimpse of it. Okay, have you seen this before? Yes. This, this footage. And uh, is that item the bloody eyeglass envelope? No. Would you hand a bloody eyeglass, a, a bloody piece of evidence to Mr. Fung? Just speculation. Oh. No. If he wasn't wearing gloves? No, absolutely not. Why not? He wasn't wearing gloves. Plus, I was the one that was packaging the evidence. Okay. Do you know in what way Mr. Fung and you were working together at this time in terms of uh, the evidence collection in this area? I'm referring to, to uh, Defense 1082. I was the one that was in the caged-in area picking up the larger items of evidence. Mr. Fung was handing me the bags, um, taking the bags from me as I was handing them out. Do you know, uh, why was it that the two of you didn't work in the cage simultaneously? At that point, there were other pieces of evidence inside that had to be picked up, and there was not enough room for both of us to be in there without running the risk of hurting some of the evidence. Okay, so only one of you was in there? Correct. That was you? That was me. And why is it that you would not hand an ungloved criminalist a bloody piece of evidence? I wouldn't hand anybody anything bloody if they were not wearing gloves. But is it for health reasons or? For Personal what? protection, right. What kinds of uh, problems are you now concerned of about as a criminalist in terms of dealing with biological evidence at a crime scene? Today we have the various types of hepatitis, we have HIV, we have AIDS, we have all kinds of things that are showing up in biologicals. Are criminalists in general uh, pretty sensitive about the health issues that are involved in collecting biological evidence? Very, very mindful of it.
Now, do you recall at the Bundy location seeing any stains on a rear gate on the 13th? I honestly don't even remember a rear gate. Okay. Do you remember having a walkthrough with uh, a detective at the beginning of your collection procedure? I remember starting on a walkthrough, yes. Do you know whether you went all the way back as, well, do you know where the rear gate is now? Now I do, yes. How? From photographs, video. Okay. When you went through the walkthrough, did you go back as far as the rear gate? No. Uh, did Mr. Fung continue on with the walkthrough? Yes, he you? did. Okay. And at the uh, Bundy location, did any of the blood uh, drops on the area that we referred to as the trail appear to have been stepped in? No. Approximately what time did you leave the Bundy location? No, it was approximately 3.15 or so, 3 o'clock, 3.15. All right, and where did you go after you left? Uh, we went back to Rockingham. Did you take the crime scene truck? Yes. And what would have you done with the gloves that you had been wearing at the Bundy location when you left? They were taken off and put in the trash bag. Before you left, did you do the same evidence inventory procedure that you've described? Yes. And do you have, uh, are you, do you have an independent recollection of exactly where that took place? Not an exact recollection. I have a, an idea where it took place, but I can't be absolutely positive. Was it outdoors? It was outdoors, yes. Can you tell us in terms of being towards the front of the uh, Bundy location, and by that I mean the Bundy side, or to the rear, towards the alley side? It was up front. All right. What time did you return to the uh, Rockingham location? Probably around 3.30 or so. Do you have any notes with you that you can use to give us the time that you collected the first item of evidence once you returned to Rockingham in the afternoon? Yes, I do. Can you, can you tell us? Do you, are you, are, do you have it memorized? Or do you need to I don't have it memorized, right. no. Please tell us what you're referring to in order to give us that okay, information. I'm referring to the evidence collection sheet. I would say that there must be a proper foundation made first before she can refresh her recollection as to whether she has independent recollection. Oh, well. Okay. It says 1540. So that's 340? 340. Was the notation as to the time in your handwriting or Mr. Fung's? My handwriting. And when you uh, made that notation, how did you do it? Did you ask someone or look at your watch or, or what? I think I just glanced at my watch. All right. And this first item was stain number 11? Correct. Which was on uh, which side of the house? It was on the side of the house near the garage on that end of the house. That little narrow walkway right. area? And is that, that's outdoors? That's outdoors. All right. Now I'd like to uh, direct your attention back to some testimony at the uh, Griffin hearing on page 758. Well, actually 757 page uh, line 25 through 758 line 4. Uh, line 25 and 758 to line 4. Do you have that, Mr. Newfield? All right, thank, thank you. you. Proceed. 
at the Griffin hearing, did you give the following answers to the following questions? Question, and what time did you get back to Rockingham, was it? Answer, right around 4 o'clock, somewhere in there. Question, how do you know it was about 4 o'clock? Answer, because of the time that is noted that we collected the sample in the foyer. Do you remember giving that testimony? Yes. Okay. So was this testimony that you got back there at 4 o'clock correct? No. And why did you testify that way? Because I was just had a chance to glance at the notes as I was testifying. All right. Now I'd like to read you another passage that, that occurred just previously to that on page 757, counsel, it's lines 12 through 15. Seven fifty-seven, twelve through 15. Just previously to that, did you give the following answer to this question? Question, so as soon as you got back to Rockingham, the first thing that you did was walk inside and lift item number 12, answer, after it was photographed. Do you recall that? Yes. So was item number 12, in fact, the first item that you collected? No. So why did you think that item number 12 was the first thing that you collected and that it was at 4 o'clock? Because, as I said, I was just going off of the notes. I didn't have time to go through them and refresh my memory, and I looked at the wrong line. Did you, you didn't, didn't you see number 11 at that time when you were testifying at the Griffin hearing and looking over the crime scene identification I checklist? honestly don't remember. Okay. But based upon the crime scene identification checklist, uh, was item number 11, in fact, the first stain that you collected in the afternoon? Yes. And who did the physical collection on that? I did. Now, did you, in fact, collect a stain number 12 in the foyer area of Rockingham. Yes. Perhaps we can see People's 169, which is the interior Rockingham map. 